Here, we're going to talk about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us a lot of useful information. Um, in particular, it relates definite integrals to derivatives. Well, to antiderivatives, but in doing so, it relates them to derivatives. It also tells us certain information about continuous functions. So let's talk about fundamental theorem of calculus. All we need, let f be continuous on a to b. So for a continuous function, part one, there are two parts of the fundamental theorem of calculus. Part one, if capital F of x is defined to be this function, the function which gives the area under a curve f of x from a to x. So notice f of x, x is our variable. So this upper bound, what we're taking the area to can vary. So we can have something like, let's say a, a to b is, um, there's f of x on a to lowercase f on a to b here. This capital F function is defined to be the area under this curve from a to x for any x value between a and b. So we're defining this function to give us that area. Part one of the fundamental theorem of calculus says that that function is continuous, but it also tells us that we can take the derivative of that function. So the derivative of this definite integral is just f of x. Now, this t in the middle is just because we want um, this variable x to be a position between a and b, and we want that to vary between a and b. Um, since we use x up here, we can't use x down inside the integral also. Um, so it's standard to use a different letter there. Well, it's, it's necessary to use a different letter. It's standard to let it be t. But notice here a couple things that we can conclude from this part. f prime of x equals f of x. This tells us that the derivative of capital F, which is the derivative of this left side, or of this right side, is just f of x. This tells us that the derivative of this integral is just f of x. It tells us that the derivative and the integral in a way cancel each other out, in a way invert each other. Just like, uh, well not just like, similar to how logarithms and exponentials invert each other. Similar to how two and one half invert each other. That's one observation, that it relates the derivative and the integral. One other observation, this left side, uh, this right side, the definite integral, remember how we can compute a definite integral. We can compute that by using areas of rectangles to approximate it and then using a limit to get the exact area. We can do that with any continuous function. So this actually tells us that that lowercase f can be any continuous function because we can make the rectangles for any continuous function. This tells us that any continuous function has an antiderivative, which is very useful to know. Part two, the integral of f from a to b equals capital F of b minus capital F of a, where capital F is any antiderivative of f of x. So to this point, if we had to compute a definite integral, we'd either have to find the areas, or for the most part, be given the areas, or go through that limit argument. Limit as n goes to infinity of the sum of f of xi times delta x, and simplify that limit. But part two of the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us that we don't need to go through that argument. All we need to do is find an antiderivative of it, lowercase f, and evaluate that at the endpoints, and then subtract. So right here, this um, fundamental theorem of calculus justifies our notation for the definite integral, notation and language, 
for the definite and indefinite integrals. So let's do, first we'll do some examples using the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And I'm just going to erase this entire board. I'm going to leave the statement of the first part on the board. I'll get rid of this. And I guess I'll get rid of that since it's not complete now. So let's do some examples. Let's do five examples. Example, find. Um, remember, we have the uh, f prime notation, and uh, that's the same as df dx. In doing some of these examples, the fractional Leibniz notation is quite useful, I think. So find df dx, um, which is the same as f prime of x, for each of these. So a. Um, I'm going to do A, B, and C, and then I'm going to erase them and do D and E. So there will be five parts. F of X equals integral from 1 to X. Maybe I should make it so it fits on one board. A. F of X equals the integral from 1 to X of 1 over T cubed plus 1 DT. B, f of x equals the integral from 4 to root x of sine of t dt. C, f of x equals the integral from 1 to x cubed of tangent of t dt. Actually, this second one I'm going to change to a secant. And then we'll do two more after these. So find df dx. Find f prime of x. Well, notice the setup here for capital F of x. a, remember, was one of the bounds on the interval. So a is just a number. x is the variable. So if we have a function that's set up as the integral from a number to x, then all we need to do to find the derivative is substitute x into our function. So here, in part a, f prime of x equals df dx. Um, for b, c, d, and e, I'm going to use df dx. For part a, I'll just leave it as f prime. For part a, we have 1 as our lower bound, x as our upper bound. So all we need to do is take f of t and replace it with x. And that's all we have to do for part A. Part B. Here I am going to use um, the fractional notation. Um, now let's look at the bounds first. First we have a 4 to root x. Now that's a 4. In the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, this lower bound can be any number, as long as it's a number. 4 is a number, 1 is a number, so that's okay. This root x, however, the fundamental theorem, the first part, applies when this upper variable is just a single x. So here, what we're going to do is use a u substitution. Remember, if we do a u substitution, then we would get df du times du dx equals df dx, which is what we want. So if we substitute u for an x quantity, then we can find the derivative we want by using the chain rule. So here, we'll let u equal root x. Well, okay, we need df du du dx. So du dx is 1 over 2 root x. Great. What about df du? Well, let's write f as a function of u. Uh, let's write it here. f as a function of u is what? The integral from 4 to u. Remember, u is root x from this substitution. So this f of u is now the integral from 4 to u of secant of t dt. 
Well, now we need df du, f prime of u. So df du equals what? Well, df du, we can apply the first part directly since this upper uh, limit is now just a single variable. f prime of u, if we replace all these x's with u's, f prime of u would equal f, lowercase f, of u. Which in this case, all we do is replace this t with a u. So we get secant of u. This uh, part a is the same as what we did here, just with a different letter. Well, we're not done yet. Um, this question wanted df dx, the f prime of x, so we have to multiply these together. So we'll say so df dx equals df du du dx, so secant of root x times 1 over 2 root x. So df dx is this times that, replace that u with, an, with a root x, because u equals root x, so you get this times that, which is just written as one fraction secant of root x over 2 root x. Now, let's, um, let's do part C. Part C can be done the same way we did part B, by making a u substitution. In this case, u would equal x cubed. But can we do it in one step? Yes. And it's good practice doing it in one step, just like doing regular derivatives. To do it in one step, let's observe where these two quantities came from, given the original in part b. The first part is just the derivative of that. The second part, well, maybe I should have said this is the first part. The du dx part is the derivative of that, the thing on top of the integral. The df du part is just this. Remember, resubstituting back in for u made secant of root x. So the df du part is just this with this root x replacing that t. So let's do that in part c. Um, debating which one I want to say goes first. Well, let's do df du first. So here, what we do is take, well first, before doing anything, we make sure the bounds are as we need them. In parts d and e, the bounds will not be as we need them. Um, so part C, the lower bound is 1, that's a number, that's okay. The upper bound is some function of x, which we can handle with a u substitution. So this is okay. So now we take this upper bound, we replace all instances of t with that. So let's say df dx, I could have probably said f prime of x here, I probably should have, is tangent of x cubed replace all t's with x cubed, all variables t, don't make it x cubed and x cubed, all variables t with x cubed, and then multiply by the derivative of that upper bound. So then times 3x squared, and I'm just going to throw that in front because I have an eraser and I can do that pretty easily. So d f d x equals derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. So 3x squared tangent of x cubed. So all we did was observe limits of the integration are 1 to some function of x, replace all t's with that function of x, and then multiply by their derivative, or its derivative. Um, if you want to try the substitution for that and go through the details like in part b, that substitution would be u equals x cubed. So let's do two more. Let's do parts D and E. D, f 
of x equals the integral from x squared to 1 of 4t over t cubed plus 3 dt. Um, I'm going to do one on this board, and I'll just do one. I'm going to do d on that board, and I'll do e on this one, potentially both boards. So e will be f of x equals the integral x cubed to x to the fourth of cosecant of t dt. So first, we have this one. First thing you do is check the bounds and make sure that they are as you need them. Number on the bottom, variables on top. Number on top, variable on the bottom. That is not what we need. But we can use a property of definite integrals to turn it into what we need. Property two of definite integrals. Property two of definite integrals said that we can flip the bounds of integration around. Provided that we throw a negative on there. So all we did here was flip the bounds around so that our bounds were as we need them in the first part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, but there was a cost, a negative. Now from here, we can proceed as in parts B and C. You can make a u substitution, u equals x squared, um, or you can just do the, the one step thing where you replace all these t's with x squared and multiply by the derivative of x squared. I'm going to do it that way. Don't forget this negative. So we have negative. Derivative of x squared is 2x, and then times, replace all t's with x squared. So 4x squared over x squared cubed. x squared cubed. Is this x to the fifth? Is this x to the sixth? Is this x to the eighth? It's one of them. Which one is it? Well, what is x squared cubed? It's an x squared here, an x squared here, an x squared here. I see six x's there. So it's x to the sixth. Um, x to the fifth would have been, if you added the exponents, which you don't do, x to the eighth would have been, I guess if you had exponentiated them, which you also don't do. Um, now here, this is a fine answer. Um, I'll just simplify it, because uh, this goes into that easily. So you get negative 8x uh, cubed, because you have 1x and two more x's, that makes 3x's, and then x to the 6th plus 3. Now, this last one, the first thing again that you do is analyze the bounds. We need a number on the bottom. We need a variable on top. We don't have any numbers here. We have bounds of x cubed and x to the fourth. Those aren't numbers. But what we can do is use rule five of definite integrals to split this into two parts. I'm going to use the number 1, because, well, let me finish writing. So what we did here, the integral from x cubed to x to the 4 of cosecant t dt equals the integral from x cubed to 1 of cosecant, uh, of cosecant t dt plus the integral from 1 to x to the 4, cosecant t dt. All we did was split this integral at 1. Now I chose 1. You can choose any number 
as long as it's in the domain of this function. So I chose 1 because I mean, 1 is an angle in quadrant 1, so cosecant is defined there. Um, I wouldn't use 0 because then I'd have to think, is cosecant defined at 0? No, it's not. Um, but I'll, you can split that at any number that's in its domain. So 1 is a perfectly good number there. Well, we've turned this into two integrals now. This second one, well, before even mentioning that, we split it into two integrals. We need the derivative. So we can do the derivative one piece at a time. The second one is already in a form on which we can apply the first part of the fundamental theorem calculus. The first one is not, because this number is on top instead of on the bottom. So what we do is flip them around and throw a negative on them, as we did over here. So equals, let's write it here. Equal, uh, maybe I should write it like this. Equals negative, let's write it lower. Equals negative integral from one to x cubed of cosecant t dt plus integral from 1 x to the fourth cosecant t dt. And now we can find derivatives of both of those definite integrals. Um, you could do up here a u substitution u equals x cubed and then over here u equals x to the fourth. Find df du, find du dx, and multiply. I'll do it in one step because uh, I talked about that in part b. So I'll say so. Uh, now I'm just going to use f prime. f prime df dx that is the same. Um, so f prime of x equals, well this one, derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. There's a negative there. Uh, let's write it a little smaller, like this. So f prime of x equals negative, derivative of x cubed is 3x squared and then replace all t's with an x cubed. So cosecant of x cubed. Plus, same thing over here. Derivative of x to the 4 is 4x cubed, and then replace all t's with x to the 4. So we found that derivative. Um, one other observation. In this one, notice, when we did our substitution, x squared had to go in twice. It goes everywhere where there's a t. So in this one, it went in one place here and in one place there. Um, so try these examples. Um, it might be useful to, uh, well, it is useful to do the u substitutions, but um, it's a good idea to try to do them in one step because it'll actually help make chain rule from chapter 3 more clear.